Welcome to the webinar, The Hospital of the Future. My name is Benny Ong, Managing Director Consulting here at Lux Research, and I will be moderating today's session. Our speaker today will be Nada from another PhD Senior Analyst here at Lux Research. Throughout the webinar, you can type any questions you have in the question box on your screen. Time permitting, we will answer all of the questions that we can. If your question does not get answered, please do not hesitate to email it to questions at luxresearchinc.com and we will respond. Over to you, Nader. Thank you very much, Benny, for the kind introduction. I'm really excited to be here today to ponder the question, what the hospital of the future will look like and what that means for all of us. So for today's webinar, I'd like to first start off by discussing some of the challenges in the healthcare industry today and how that will shape the hospital of the future. And then I'll move on to discuss how certain emerging technologies are already looking to solve for some of these challenges and how you can benefit by interacting with some of these technologies uh, and benefit from this rapidly shifting landscape as well. And finally, I'll conclude by discussing how all of what I've discussed in uh, sections one and two will contribute to the outlook for the hospital of the future. So let's get started. So first up, the healthcare industry today really faces three major challenges. First, rising healthcare costs. Now, rising healthcare costs doesn't just affect the end user or the patient, it also greatly impacts government spending. Uh, and it's impacting much of the developed world as well as many developing economies as well. Now, the situation has been further exacerbated by the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a few examples here illustrate that point. Now, Finland's entire government resigned a few years ago over failed healthcare reform plans. And Singapore widely seen to be one of the most uh, efficient and cost-effective systems is already starting to project that healthcare expenditure will now exceed the growth in GDP. And in the United States, you know, health is, healthcare spending accounts for almost 20% of its GDP, uh, the highest per capita spend in the world. So clearly a major challenge uh, for many different economies around the world. The second is, you know, the basically the rise of chronic diseases um, and the growth in uh, the aging population as well around the world. And both of these are quite closely linked, as I'll discuss in a second. Now, the world is really getting older on average. Uh, you know, data points to the fact that um, already as of 2019, almost 10% of the world is age 65 and above. And by 2050, the number will almost double. Uh, for people aged 80 years and above, uh, while the numbers are still small right now at about 2%, uh, that number is also expected to uh, more than double to 4.4% by 2050. So we're seeing a world that's rapidly aging, uh, which is really giving rise to what we call a super age society where 20% or more of the population is aged 65 years and above. Uh, in 2015, already three countries are in this club, uh, Japan, Germany, and Italy. And by 2030, which is the end of this decade, uh, we expect to see another five countries um, joining this club as well, uh, namely South Korea, France, Switzerland, the UK, and the US, with Australia and China uh, you know, trailing close behind. And you know, with uh, you know an increased uh, aged population, there is also a commensurate increased risk in um, you know contracting chronic diseases as well. So these two go hand in hand. And finally, um, social demographic shifts, um, especially arising from the developed. Uh, economies will pose a challenge to the healthcare industry as well. Now, around 90% of the global middle class growth uh, is expected to come from only three parts of the world, namely China, India, and Southeast Asia. Uh, and the numbers you see below 
reflect the number of people who will now move to the middle class segment. And these numbers are, are pretty large, right? In China and India, you see over 300 million people, which is more than the population of the United States itself. Um, and another important point to note is that while geographically speaking, this is just a small corner of the world, uh, this region of the world contributes to about half the world's population. China and India alone are close to 3 billion, and Southeast Asia is reaching 1 billion very soon. So all in, you are seeing about 4 billion people living in this part of the world. Uh, so clearly any changes in uh, wealth distribution, any changes in urbanization uh, will impact healthcare demand uh, and the quality of care as well. So clearly going to impact uh, the healthcare industry. Uh, this graph here just illustrates uh, how, despite what I've talked about, the social demographic shifts, um, a lot of these economies are still below the WHO recommendation for uh, the ideal ratio for doctor to patient. Right? So WHO recommends at least two doctors per thousand patients, but you'll see that you know, in many of these countries, like China, India, Indonesia, and so on, they're well below this uh, number. Uh, Whereas other, its other peers in more developed parts of the world um, are seeing you know, better ratios, including those in the, in the Europe and also in North America. So these emerging economies, they're rapidly developing, but they're struggling to catch up to meet the healthcare needs of these economies. So clearly hospitals, you know, has, they have to radically evolve to address these challenges. Uh, it takes time to build hospitals, it takes even longer to train healthcare personnel. So uh, we clearly can't make them fast enough to meet these evolving needs. So we definitely need to reimagine how our hospitals can continue to meet these evolving demands efficiently. And a couple of questions uh, I like to sort of, uh, you know, come back to again, and really, you know, have you think through as well, is how can we firstly radically increase the efficiency of existing hospitals and clinical centers? In other words, how can we do more with existing resources? and make them operate more efficiently. And secondly, how can we still maintain a high quality of care uh, and at the same time, reduce the workload of providers, especially given the current COVID-19 pandemic, which is placing a massive burden uh, on global uh, healthcare providers. So how can we improve the provision of care, uh, but at the same time, uh, ensure that uh, providers are not getting burnt out? So we'll answer some of these questions in this section here. So first up, um, you know, I'd like to point out that a lot of these enabling technologies that we're seeing come through and provide new solutions for some of these problems are largely speaking digital. You know, digital transformation is really key to a lot of this. A lot of the examples I'm going to talk about in a second, you'll see largely involve uh, digital technologies. Uh, and so it's already playing a big role right now and will continue to play a major driving force uh, improving the provision of care and optimizing operations as well. So the way I want to discuss this is by breaking this down into the provision of care, which is the more front-facing element of uh, doctor-patient engagement, right? Uh, so that interface where uh, the care is given and how that element can be improved. Um, and then I'll talk about operations, which is more back-end um, and how, how these different uh, elements can be uh, made more efficient and optimized. So let me first start by talking about provision of care, and I'll discuss remote expertise uh, and discuss one use case here, which is telehealth. Uh, well, telehealth, uh, at the very core, is basically the remote provision of care outside a traditional healthcare provider setting. So in Historically, it's been done by uh, phone calls, more recently through Skype calls, and of course now with the uh, you know, prol proliferation of uh, personal devices, and smartphones, and health IoT devices, uh, those tools can be used as well as part of uh, telehealth care, where a lot of data um, that's collected from uh, connected glucose patches, um, your smartphones, smartwatches, and so on, uh, the data can be integrated and uh, be communicated to your uh, healthcare provider remote. Uh, now, what's great about this is that it uh, provides ease of access 
Um, so it's on demand. Uh, patients can access it whenever they want. It's easily integrable into larger health ecosystems as well as super apps that we're seeing emerge now. Um, and it's easy to scale, right? And you can reach a, a wider population quickly as well. So a lot of benefits here. Uh, there's some example developers I've, I've uh, shown just below here. Uh, Teledoc, clearly a very big player in North America, uh, you know, providing uh, what I just described, uh, access to telehealth consultation to a smartphone. But a company in China called Ping'an, which is the largest insurer in China, uh, a subsidiary under them called Ping'an Good Doctor, has developed these one-minute clinics where any patient can walk through these uh, booths that are deployed you know, in uh, public spaces in over 12 provinces in China. Uh, they walk into the booth, uh, and within one minute, uh, they get a consult using an AI chatbot. And based on the consult, if a prescription is given, they can walk out, go to the smart cabinet, scan the QR code, get access to prescription medications, and you know, carry on with the day. Right? So decentralizing that element of care uh, and you know, preventing that uh, burden on uh, limited healthcare facilities in very large cities. Pfizer and HaloDoc, a digital health company in Indonesia, have partnered up to build a digital health platform to support breast cancer patients uh, by not only providing telehealth consultation support, but also medication delivery right to the doorstep as well. So really kind of going the extra mile to make sure that the patients get the care they need. Uh, in terms of maturity, uh, telehealth is a pretty mature uh, technology right now, uh, especially given the fact that COVID-19 has driven uh, telehealth uh, to really limit you know, the number of face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, so the technology has really matured very quickly in a short span of time. Now, decision support is where doctors uh, rely on tools that help them to make decisions. So, you know, thus reducing some of the uh, workload for them and allowing them to focus more on providing care to the patient. And a good example here is medical imaging. Now, artificial intelligence for medical imaging really capitalizes on computer vision and machine learning for clinical decision support. It's trained using millions of medical image data sets. Uh, and these AI capabilities, really what they are, is they're trying to attempt to simulate the experience and reasoning an expert develops through the course of his or her training uh, through algorithms, right? And so straightforward cases can be rapidly processed really freeing up time for doctors to focus on more complex cases. Um, and you know, what this also eventually will lead to is shorter wait time for patients uh, from getting a scan done to getting an expert diagnosis. Uh, of course, you know, being in a field in AI, a lot of tech developers are very active in the space. Uh, Google AI uh, is probably a big name you might recognize, but other developers like Artrace, Zebra Medical Vision, AI Doc, and Path AI also uh, you know, rapidly growing. Uh, Zebra Medical Vision, for example, already has over seven FDA uh, cleared um, algorithms that are being used um, in the industry right now. So in terms of maturity, uh, these are currently moderately mature. I say moderate because uh, it is starting to get adopted by a number of healthcare providers, but you know it's it's not as widely adopted as uh, as you might think because of challenges in integrating them to clinical workflows, uh, getting buy-in from uh, physicians. Uh, and so on and so forth. So some of those hurdles still lie, but you know, very promising technology. Convenience of access, right? And this is really kind of allowing patients to be able to access these tools, you know, uh, whenever they want it. And an example here I like to discuss is digital therapeutics. Uh, fairly new uh, player to the to the game. Uh, you know, digital therapeutics essentially delivers evidence-based therapeutic interventions, either purely through software, uh, like apps, or it can be software-enabled products, um, you know, for example, like the VR headset here, to prevent, manage, or treat a broad spectrum of diseases. Now, the great thing with digital therapeutics is that you can automate therapy sessions that typically would require brick-and-mortar centers, uh, bulky equipment, or you know, trained personnel. So you can really save costs, uh, and also the technology can be easily scaled and it can be rapidly disseminated to a wide group of patients. Uh, this removes the pressure from the provider, allowing it to, allowing the provider to realign, and redistribute resources to really meet urgent cases more effectively. 
uh, a few example developers uh, I've highlighted below. Pair Therapeutics is one uh, where they were the first to have an FDA-approved digital therapeutic on the market. Uh, the therapeutic was called Reset, and you see uh, an image of a dashboard of Reset here. It's meant to uh, treat patients who are uh, suffering from substance abuse disorder. So, you know, they can basically uh, start the therapy sessions on the app uh, and track their progress and you know, be in touch with the doctor whenever they need to, or the therapist rather, whenever they need to. Uh, Oxford VR develops these VR headsets that allow patients to, uh, you know, run through these sessions that helps them manage uh, different kinds of mental disorders ranging from fear of heights to stress and so on. So the maturity for these technologies uh, are fairly low at this stage, uh, which is not unexpected because it's a fairly new technology. Uh, you know, it's only a number of FDA approved uh, digital therapies are on the market now. So clearly there's a, there's a period of, you know, getting physicians to understand how these tools can really help them improve outcomes. And of course, uh, payers have to understand how these tools can be reimbursed as well. So there's a bit of building that awareness and education but it's a very promising technology uh, nonetheless. And last but not least under provision of care is personalization, really personalizing uh, how care is given. And one way to do this is by using precision medicine. You might have heard of this term before. Essentially, it aims to improve healthcare delivery by combining a range of different data sources, uh, ranging from biological, environmental to lifestyle information to really develop tailored approaches in not just treating, but also predicting disease progression as well. And targeted treatment and prevention is more likely to improve health outcomes because doctors can understand beforehand what kind of treatment should be given to them, what would trigger an adverse outcome and so on. So you can manage unsustainable healthcare costs and prevent unwanted outcomes as well. Uh, now, most precision medicine efforts are very focused on genomics. So you might hear genomics and precision medicine being used uh, very often. Uh, genomics is a technology that's evolved very quickly. It's becoming very accessible. It's uh, used a lot in diagnostics. So it's a core foundational technology under precision medicine. But other, in, other technologies can also complement it, like proteomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, which is a much early stage. But they also provide vital information that can help in precision medicine. Uh, most of the developers today are big uh, biotech companies or pharmaceuticals, as you can imagine. Uh, the maturity is still low because, as I just mentioned, a lot of the technologies to do precision medicine is still evolving uh, and still part of, uh, I would say, R&D. So promising, but still a very early stage. So now I'll move on to I'll discuss the provision of care and how there are different technologies that are coming in to support the provision of care. Uh, now I'll talk about how operations itself can be improved and I'll start with uh, workflow optimization. So workflow optimization is really talking about how you can improve how a hospital operates, right? And AI tools uh, really can play a big part here where they can study the utilization and movement of physical assets and manpower and really find ways to best optimize their usage to boost productivity and efficiency in healthcare organizations. Now, this has the ability to improve operational performance, productivity, and efficiency for a given set of resources. Uh, patients can receive care in a timely manner, uh, potentially supporting better health outcomes. And of course, you know, it can potentially reduce costs associated with improper utilization of resources and save money for the provider. Uh, I've listed a few different developers here. Many of them, like QVentures and Colleries, are already showing uh, improvement by reducing wait times uh, and allowing doctors to see more patients uh, in a given day. So this technology is very promising, uh, moderately mature, because again, as with a lot of new technologies, it requires some time to uh, integrate into existing workflows and get buy-in from uh, physicians and other healthcare stakeholders, but already starting to show uh, some some uh, you know improved outcomes here. Risk management, right? Risk management, uh, really, you know, in terms of understanding your patient population, uh, analyzing the risk and managing the risk, right? Again, artificial intelligence plays a big role here in managing population health for hospital systems and insurers as well. 
Now, features can include uh, providing predictive analytics and risk scoring. So how likely is a patient to fall, to be readmitted, to miss the appointments, uh, even patient fatalities. And visibility into these trends will really allow these providers to better stratify different risk groups and plan accordingly. Um, now, payers also can use this data to better adjust risks based on patient population clinical data, saving them costs. So you can see some of these developers here are already partnering with uh, healthcare organizations uh, and working on ways to better improve uh, their risk analysis. Again, just like the hospital operations, moderately mature, uh, gaining traction, but uh, you know it has to, uh, you know, integrate into existing workflows as well as uh, gain more uh, buy-in and adoption for physicians. Last but not least is really uh, getting data to talk to each other, essentially de-siloing data, right? And I think, you know, we all probably are well aware that, you know, a lot of healthcare data sits um, within hospitals, uh, but often uh, they, you know, sit in very siloed, uh, sit in a very siloed manner, right? Um, now, that's unfortunate because, you know, if these data can be shared across different organizations, of course, you know, complying with the different regulations like HIPAA, uh, more insights can be extracted. The challenge is that, of, of course, there are a lot of concerns about how the data has been used, uh, privacy, security, and so on. But also data formats tend to differ depending on which vendors a particular provider works with. Um, so having interoperability of these electronic health records is something that can really potentially uh, unlock uh, the power of the data that's contained, right? And a number of developers here, uh, you might recognize your Amazon and your Apple, but even smaller developers like Tier Eon and Gem uh, are looking to use blockchain to try to uh, remove the complexities of trust and building security as well. Uh, so this is potentially very promising because it allows data from different organizations to talk to each other. Uh, to build these health lakes, like what Amazon is doing, and extract um, very powerful insights that can help in the provision of care. Uh, maturity is fairly low because uh, there's a lot of hurdles to get around. Mostly, I would say it's very uh, psychological uh, and building that awareness around you know, uh, the fact that this can be done uh, and ensuring that the data can be secure and uh, you know um, protected. But uh, you know it's it's been it's been uh, tried out in a number of different organizations and uh, holds promise as well. So to quickly give you a summary, right, of uh, some of these near-term opportunities I just discussed, uh, you can see there are a range of them here. Um, you know, telehealth being mature, but the others are moderately mature to low maturity. Um, now, you know, you might be thinking as you know a healthcare player, or even if I'm a non-healthcare player, you know, how can I you know, really leverage this knowledge, um, and where can I be operating? Should I be operating in a high maturity area, moderately mature area, or low maturity area? The answer is you can operate in any of them. Uh, it just matters, you know, how you see yourself uh, interacting with players in that ecosystem, and how you can uh, solve for a problem statement uh, meaningfully in that ecosystem. Now, telehealth, right? You know, looks pretty saturated, high maturity, but you know, as I discussed, you know, some of these players are going a step further. They're building additional solutions. They're providing medication delivery. So they're building these ecosystems. And you as a, as, as a player may see an opportunity in trying to be a part of that ecosystem. This is where an opportunity may lie. For moderately mature areas like medical imaging on the operation side um, with the hospitals and risk analysis, uh, these are, you know, very tech-driven you know, pieces where, you know, if you're a tech developer, uh, electronics uh, manufacturer, or sensor manufacturer, you might see some opportunities here to be working with some of these uh, healthcare stakeholders. And in low areas, you know, uh, where there's a lot of innovation that still needs to happen in terms of technology, uh, in terms of data analysis and so on, uh, there's plenty of space to play here. So uh, these are some of the things that you can think of right now. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, probably the bigger question you probably have coming to this webinar is, all right, that's that's fantastic, but what will the hospital of the future really look like? You know, based on what I've just shared with you, I've shared how some of these technologies are starting to shape healthcare, providing more opportunities for patients and for hospitals to operate better, to improve care. 
But what does that mean for the hospital of the future? Right. So let's dive into that question uh, in this final section here. So very often, uh, you know, when I ask some of our, of our clients, uh, you know, what they think about the hospital of the future, you know, uh, I think the a lot of the answers center around, uh, you know, very advanced futuristic looking technologies within a hospital, uh, robotics, automation, something like what you see here, right? Uh, you know, this futuristic landscape of a, of a hospital, less human beings, more automation, faster treatment, and all of that. And, you know, you might even imagine cases uh, where you don't even need a human being there. You don't need a doctor, fully automated, right? I think that's, you know, a possibility as well. But I think that's, that's just a small part of what the hospital of the future really can be, right? Because all we're discussing in this context is what's happening within the physical hospital, right? But, and I'll discuss this in a second, you know, we think that it can be so much more. Right beyond just a physical location. And so what do I mean by that? So if you think about the hospital of today, right, in a typical uh, urban landscape, uh, now you might have a hospital, a large hospital center, and a smaller clinic, which serves as a, as more of a primary uh, point of care, right? And you can imagine some of the technologies I just discussed being already uh, embedded within the systems, AI-based medical imaging, telehealth, and so on, right? Playing a big role. But a lot of these technologies are still mostly intrinsic to the hospital, right? It just helps the hospital um, operate better, more efficiently. Uh, all the things I've discussed, right? And that's fantastic. But we have to take into account another major shift in what's happening around us today, which is the fact that connected devices are becoming more and more pervasive uh, all around us. And I'm not just talking about smartwatches. I'm not just talking about uh, your Fitbit, right? Uh, I'm talking about, you know, biosensors everywhere, you know, from your vehicles to your computers, your smartphones, your smart home assistants, uh, you know, having you know, ceiling mounts now that are collecting data, uh, flooring and bed having pressure sensors, measuring different elements of your movement. And that's only off the body sensors. You know, on the body sensors, you know, I talked about your smartphones, you know, there's, uh, you know, headsets, there's uh, smart rings, and so on and so forth. Many different sensors collecting all kinds of data, very valuable and informative about your health. And all of this uh, data can become an integral component of uh, providing support for the healthcare system to the provision of care and improving hospital operations as well indirectly because it provides information about all hospitals uh, can better analyze risk and improve their workflows, plan accordingly based on, you know, some of these tools, uh, some of these data uh, streams. And so while we still think a physical hospital will be necessary, will be important, uh, ultimately the hospital will become more of a niche uh, center where Complex operations, complex surgery still has to happen within the hospital. We're not saying that a hospital will not exist anymore. But it will become more of a control tower as well, where it's collecting a lot of this data. I talked about connected devices. Um, I talked about you know, vehicle sensors. Ford, for example, is working to uh, build glucose sensors within the car connected to your um, uh, health IoT devices as well. So allowing diabetic drivers uh, to, be, to be assessed if they're facing any uh, uh, hypoglycemic events, uh, building sensors, smart home sensors, obviously your smart uh, your smartphones and your smart watches, and even your help, your first responders can be equipped with tools that can provide very actionable data to the hospital, allowing them to triage care. I talked about Ping An, Amazon, Apple, Verizon is building uh, or already has a 5G lab uh, that's equipping first responders with uh, better capabilities to provide care within uh, an ambulance as well right and so the hospital of the future you know rather than thinking of it as becoming more of a sophisticated futuristic place i like to sort of move and shift that thinking outside the fact that it can be just a place right and here i'm just going to allude to uh um, certainly my favorite one of my favorite uh superhero characters Thor, in one of the Thor movies you know he mentioned that 
Asgard, which is where he's from, is not a place, it's actually a people. And just like how the internet has seen the rise of IoT, right, where internet has become ubiquitous, uh, moving away from the desktop towards, you know, all kinds of devices that you have, the hospital of the future will pretty much be something like this as well. It'll be pervasive, ubiquitous, will be part of everything we do. Right, so we like to think of the hospital of the future as wherever you need it to be, wherever you want it to be. You know, we have to move away from the thinking of patients just, you know, uh, being someone who goes to a doctor, you know, or has to lie on a bed, gets an injection, gets drips. You know, uh, care can be given outside the hospital setting as well. You know, uh, emerging technologies like digital therapeutics, digital biomarkers, which I didn't have a chance to discuss today, uh, also playing a very vital role, collecting a lot of this data. Uh, facial recognition technologies are now sophisticated enough to be able to predict uh, fatigue, stress, and other health events like Affectiva, which has a large database of millions and millions of uh, different facial cues and expressions. I talked about 5G focus responders. So you can imagine how these different um, technologies um, can be part of uh, you know, your different environments, your different uh, parts of your urban environment. Uh, now, it can be part of your home as well, as I've discussed, uh, and even in your workplace, right, where it's providing uh, different sorts of uh, capabilities, uh, you know, from having smart textiles within your body, relaying uh, data to the providers as well. So data, your hospital, pro your hospital center will be more of a data integration and an AI-based triage that will help to coordinate a lot of these responses, but you'll still be able to perform a lot of its uh, complex uh, procedures that were designed to do as well. So I'll end off here by uh, kind of just running through three key takeaways um, for today. Now, challenges in the healthcare system will shape the hospital of the future. Uh, new and emerging technologies today are already making an impact and will continue to shape the healthcare industry. Um, and ultimately, all of this will lead to a more patient-centric, decentralized model of care, allowing the hospital of the future to really transcend the concept of just a physical location to, you know, wherever it needs to be, depending on you know, where you are and the technologies that you have with you. So with that, I'll uh, end the discussion for today, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Thanks, Nadia. We'll now be taking questions that you may have on the presentation, which you can type in through the question box. If we do not get to your questions on this call, someone from Lux will be in touch after the webinar. Okay, the first question, Nadia. My company is not in healthcare. What can I do to take advantage of these shifts in the industry? Yes, that's a, that, that's a great question, Benny. Um, you know, this is, this is what I think is very exciting about the hospital of the future because you don't actually need to be in the healthcare industry to actually take advantage of this. Um, in fact, um, you know, we've seen a lot of the uh, emerging technologies I discussed actually has its foundation in uh, artificial intelligence, has, in, has its foundation in, uh, you know, electronics and biosensors and so on. And even beyond that, you know, if you're, uh, you know, uh, someone who's in the CPG industry or the food and nutrition industry, uh, or even the mobility industry, you know, where you can provide services by uh, sending medical prescriptions to the doorstep, uh, like in one of the examples I discussed, um, or uh, transporting doctors or patients to medical appointments, right? Um, now, if you're a food and nutrition player, you can see, you know, potentially see a space where you can uh, maybe work with telehealth providers to also provide uh, clinical nutrition to patients uh, who need them. Um, so there are plenty of opportunities uh, you know, to think about um, beyond just uh, you know, developing a drug or providing or building a better medical device. Uh, as we think about more holistic, comprehensive care, uh, the hospital of the future, like I said, is, is going to be uh, more of a concept as opposed to a futuristic physical location. Well, that, that will still be part of the hospital in the future, but it'll be more than that. So, you know, um, you, you can think about how you, know, you might want to embed your capabilities, um, you know, with different partners uh, in the space. Thank you, Nada. 
Now that concludes our webinar for today. The slide presentation and recording from this webinar will be sent to all attendees via email. Additionally, check out our upcoming webinars and more information about this year's Lux Executive Summit. Our 17th annual event is taking place the first week of October. After leaving the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a survey on today's presentation. We would appreciate any feedback you may have to help inform and improve future webinars. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.